Cambridge Preparation for the TOEFL Test, 4th Edition, CD 7, Practice 1, Listening Section. Listen to part of a lecture in a business studies class. Okay, so we've outlined a number of techniques for effective decision making. Uh, now let's focus on one approach to figuring out how to uh, make good business decisions. Okay. So, uh, one way of deciding whether to go ahead with some new investment project is to perform what's known as CBA, or Cost-Benefit Analysis. CBA can estimate and total up the money values of both the benefits and costs to a community, institution, or business to establish whether an investment choice is worthwhile. So let's assume you've generated solutions to a business problem and have thought really carefully about which way to go. You think you have the best solution available, but before going ahead with any investment decision, what you need to do is add up the value of the benefits as well as the costs of this action. Now, uh, what I mean by costs and benefits here is always it's, it's always expressed in monetary terms. So, um, we find out what the cost is in money terms and also what the benefits might be, also in money terms. Uh, then, we subtract the costs from the benefits and we can choose whether to go ahead or not. All right. In simple terms, costs tend to be what we spend on something. Um, say, for example, a new piece of machinery. And, uh, and benefits are uh, what advantages, expressed in money units, we get over the lifetime of that machinery because of having purchased it as opposed to, well, <laughs> not having it or having some alternative. Um, in, in such a case, we can figure out a fairly simple CBA just by looking at expenses and uh, then subtracting them from the savings brought about by uh, improved, uh, the improvements of introducing the machinery. That would include things like the savings met by not having to pay salaries to employees who previously did the work of the machine. We could add the fact that the machines make fewer mistakes, <laughs> we hope, than human employees so there will be fewer rejected products. But on the other hand, we have to factor in the cost of running the machines, uh, such as maybe the increased electricity bill, the cost of repairs, and of course, the cost of training someone to operate the new equipment. So that much is pretty straightforward. But we also have to think about less tangible, less visible costs and benefits. Cost-benefit analysis really only works if we're careful to add in all the costs and benefits. Uh, costs, especially, are sometimes hidden. For example, in, in paying for this new stuff, we're taking liquid money and spending it, right? So we're no longer paid interest from having that money in a bank or otherwise invested. Okay, so we have to subtract that loss from the benefit side. Then, suppose also that the new machines are noisy. That means soundproofing. That's a cost. Or, or will it take up more space than the replaced workers and therefore require an addition to the building? These are less obvious costs, but they should be factored in to get an accurate picture. When we do CBA in a more public domain... Uh, say, on the building of a new road, the calculations can become even more tricky. Although there's some impressive software nowadays that helps us out, of course. So, how do we measure the benefits here? Does the road improve or worsen people's lives? A new road may, for example, uh, damage some wildlife habitat or some residential community may be inconvenienced by the noise or air pollution. On the other hand, the new road could improve property values by decreasing commuting times. Um, it could also save human lives since it's safer than the old road.
In practice, CBA tries to put a value on all these things, although a lot of people may not like what it says. What it does is try to find out how people really value these apparently subjective things by looking at the financial choices they're prepared to make to gain a benefit or to avoid something on the cost side. In this way, we can put a monetary figure on all benefits and costs. Of course, these calculations can be complex and sometimes controversial. But I want to point out that CBA is a powerful tool and perhaps the most rational way of choosing whether to go ahead with a complex investment decision. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? 2. In the lecture, the professor describes some costs and benefits of investing in new machinery. Indicate whether each of the following is a cost or a benefit for a company planning on making an investment decision. Three. Why does the professor mention the introduction of machinery? Four. Why does the professor say this? So that much is pretty straightforward. But we also have to think about less tangible, less visible costs and benefits. Five. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. When we do CBA in a more public domain, uh, say on the building of a new road, the calculations can become even more tricky. Although there's some impressive software nowadays that helps us out, of course. Why does the professor say this? Say on the building of a new road. Six. According to the professor, how does CBA evaluate subjective things? Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Hi, Dr. Johnson. I came by to discuss my research paper. I dropped it by on Monday. Uh, about the nutritional value of chocolate? Oh, yes, Lisa, that's right. Have you had a chance to look at it yet? Yeah, I sure have. Uh, let me dig it out of my files. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Well, Lisa, you've done a fine job of citing your sources and writing up your reference page. But you used a lot of Internet resources for your information. That's right. Uh, you said we could, didn't you? Oh, yeah, but I also said to be sure to evaluate the site to make sure that it's worthwhile before you used it. This one here that I've circled, I don't think this is what I'd call a good source. But it has the university address of a professor. Isn't it okay to use sites with the .edu domain in the address? Well, you have to look beyond just the address. Yes, you are correct that this site is that of a professor, a professor at a very prestigious university, in fact. But did you notice this particular set of web pages were student papers that the professor had uploaded for the class to read and critique? You happen to have used one of the student papers. Well, that particular student may have done a fine job in his or her research, but a student is hardly an expert in the field. Oh, I hadn't realized that it was a student's work. I just noticed that it was on the website of a professor and thought, well, that it would be his work. Mm, you really need to investigate a bit deeper before you use online material. You could have checked the sources that the student had used. There might have been some useful papers by experts in that student's reference page. Okay. Now, the study here that you've cited looks very good. 
but did you notice that the person who did the study works for a laboratory that's funded by a major chocolate company? Oh, so it's biased. Well, perhaps. At least it should be taken with a grain of salt. But it might also be very good research. So with data like that, data which may be biased, you should try to find an independent person who's run the same kind of experiment. Remember that a good experiment should be, well, you should be able to replicate it. So if a major chocolate company comes out with a study, we should have other people looking at that research with a critical but open mind. So it might be a good source. I don't have to throw it out. Right. But I think you should try to find more studies to back up the results. Okay. So has that been helpful? Yes. Oh, yeah, very, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. I really appreciate your help. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 7. Why does the student go to see her professor? 8. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. But it has the university address of a professor. Isn't it okay to use sites with the .edu domain in the address? Well, you have to look beyond just the address. Yes, you are correct that this site is that of a professor, a professor at a very prestigious university, in fact. Why does the professor say this? Well, you have to look beyond just the address. Nine. Why does Dr. Johnson criticize the student's use of a university website? Ten. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Now, the study here that you've cited looks very good. But did you notice that the person who did the study works for a laboratory that's funded by a major chocolate company? Oh, so it's biased. Well, perhaps. At least it should be taken with a grain of salt. Why does the professor say this? It should be taken with a grain of salt. It should be taken with a grain of salt. Why does the professor say this? It should be taken with a grain of salt. Eleven. What does the professor say about the re listen to part of a lecture in an architecture class? So, now I'd like to focus on the Prairie School of Architecture which developed the most significant architectural style in North America in the first decades of the 20th century. The main influences on this style came from several places. For example, the philosophy and practice of the architect Louis Sullivan. Now, you may remember that Sullivan liked to say that form follows function. In other words, the shape and structure of a building should follow, should, should depend on the purpose, the intended use of the building. There was also the English arts and crafts movement. That was important around this time, too. That was a second important influence. And I should mention traditional Oriental themes, which also played an important part in the Prairie School ideas. Now, the students and followers of Sullivan the most famous of whom was Frank Lloyd Wright, developed these themes and ideas into a truly American style, a style expressing a belief in the unity of mankind and nature. Now, when people think of architecture, they, they often think of large public buildings. But most of the effort of the Prairie School was devoted to domestic buildings, mainly houses for well-to-do private citizens. So, 
Can anyone here describe to me any of the important features of prairie school houses? Didn't they mostly have long horizontal lines rather than a vertical appearance? Yes, yes, they did. That's certainly part of it. We can say that the most visible external features of this architecture were horizontal lines and heavy roofs projecting away from the walls. The shapes were designed to both harmonize with and reflect the broad, flat prairies of the Midwestern United States. But somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, especially in the Chicago suburbs, rather than on the prairies themselves. Okay, now, what about the insides, the interiors? Didn't they want to do away with small rooms? Well, in a sense, yes. Um, there was certainly an emphasis on keeping the number of separate rooms to a minimum, um, opening up living space, and uh, designing internal walls so that the light and view created a sense of unity. The idea was to reduce the number of interior corners typical of traditional European houses. See, prairie school architects thought of this of this traditional home as confining, both physically and, and also spiritually. So, by ridding the inside of houses of, of so many rooms and corners and walls, they hoped to create a feeling of, of movement and freedom. Their ideal of beauty was to try to make the living space more compatible with human proportions and living requirements. Often, Large fireplaces were built at the center of the overall design rather than attached to an outside wall. And this gave additional structural support to the building, so it further allowed the building to get by with fewer interior walls. Now, let me add that, in line with their belief in the importance of nature, these architects related the interiors to the surrounding natural landscape by their use of windows that were continuous ribbons of glass. So, in that way, the outside and inside of the houses were more closely related. Other ways they suggested the importance of nature were in designing terraces projecting from the external walls with parapets, walls that were used as, as planting boxes for flowers and shrubs, and deep roof overhangs that led the eye toward the horizon. Of course, not all prairie school houses had all these features, but certainly we can say that there was a general tendency among these architects to provide their designs with many of them. Okay, so now we've discussed overall structure. Now what about ornamentation? Uh, didn't they reject almost all decorative elements? Well, not entirely. Although it's true they like to keep things simple. Again, this was in line with their opposition to what they perceived as, as the fussiness of more traditional housing styles. We can say that ornamentation was only permitted if it, if it complemented, if it, if it blended in with the overall expression and feeling of the building. So, to this end, the Prairie School architects tended to use simple, unmixed, natural materials, sometimes with geometric or oriental designs. For example, many of the prairie houses had a turned-up roof edge, reminiscent of traditional Japanese houses. Okay, so finally, I'd like to mention that these architects usually designed all the furniture that went with each house. Each piece of furniture, whether built-in or freestanding, was carefully crafted to fit in with the overall feeling of the house. Again, natural materials were preferred and restful horizontal lines were emphasized. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 12. What is the lecture mainly about? Thirteen. What can be said about the nature of prairie school architecture?
14. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. The shapes were designed to both harmonize with and reflect the broad, flat prairies of the Midwestern United States. But somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, especially in the Chicago suburbs, rather than on the prairies themselves. Why does the professor say this? Somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas. Fifteen. According to the professor, how did the prairie school architects make living space more compatible with human needs? Sixteen. What does the professor say about the use of ornamentation by prairie school architects? Seventeen. Why does the professor mention traditional Japanese houses? Listen to lecture in a psychology class. Okay, now I'd like to present an idea that has recently become much talked about in the fields of biology and psychology, and also in studies of cultural transmission. I should point out that some of what this is is not fully accepted by some academics, but I'm bringing this up today just to, well, hopefully wet your appetite. Okay, now you're all familiar, of course, with the term gene, and how it's considered as the unit of inheritance. As you know, we inherit our genes from our parents, and then we pass them on to our kids. What genes do? Is replicate, that is, they make copies of themselves. Some scientists even like to claim that animals and plants and all organisms are just essentially systems for the transmission of genes from one generation to the next. Now, sometimes genes make mistakes, and the mutant forms that result may make new life forms. At least, if they succeed, make mistakes. And the mutant forms that result may make new life forms, at least if they succeed. If the environment in which they find themselves is suitable, they will succeed and thrive and reproduce. Now, of course, environments differ from place to place, and successful genes, which inhabit various organisms, themselves change the environment. The pressures of the changing environment lead to variation in the organisms, and this eventually creates the vast complexity of life. All right, so now I want to bring in here something that is kind of like a gene in the way it behaves. This thing is called a meme. Now it's spelled M-E-M-E. -E. The term meme was invented by the zoologist Richard Dawkins. To refer to a unit of information in our minds, which influences events, so that copies of itself are passed on to other minds. Some people have described memes as patterns of information that are passed on to other minds. Some people have described memes as patterns of information that spread,、uh, just like viruses or or bacteria, and which alter the behavior, even if in a very subtle,、uh, very small, or hardly noticeable way. Causing the host to pass on the pattern. In a sense, they're parasites because they use us, or at least our brains, as a springboard for their transmission to other brains. The essential point is that a meme replicates. That is, it's a, it's capable of imitation, just like a gene. A meme can be an idea, a song, a, a joke, a food recipe. Or even a way of constructing bridges. How to make a fire could be considered another one. What is important here is that memes are imitated and thus passed on from one person to another. Also, they don't even have to be true.
They just have to, in some way, make sense to us. Memes seem to come in all sizes. They can be as small as, say, a, a new slang term, to very large. That is to say, a, a whole way of looking at the world, say, a, a political ideology. Some people who write about memes would probably call such a large meme a meme complex, a whole set of memes clustered together for, as it were, mutual protection. All right, so the useful thing about this idea is that it enables us to explain certain things about behavior and even our physical makeup that are difficult to explain without it. At the most simple level, it helps us to understand why some ideas survive and some just drop out of sight. The memes that are transmitted are the survivors. And just as genes group together, so to speak, to form organisms that can reproduce, so memes may cluster together in human brains and pass on to other brains complex systems of thought, such as political ideas or even scientific theories. Now, if we ask why our minds always appear to be active and full of thoughts, we can answer using this meme idea, that it is because memes need to get repeated over and over in our heads. They need to be rehearsed and remembered. If they're not thought about and transferred to another brain, <laughs> they'll die out, disappear. So, from the meme's point of view, it's necessary to be practiced then passed on to another mind. According to some theorists in this field, the reason our minds are continually filling up with ideas is that the memes force us to. One person has even suggested that the human brain, with all its complexity, was in some way designed by memes in order to promote their own success. Furthermore, surprisingly, it's claimed that we ourselves are not the ones who benefit from our ideas. It's, you guessed it, the memes themselves. The self itself is a meme. In other words, at least some theorists seem to be saying, we are nothing but temporary groupings of memes that have come together in order to be protected and passed on to other minds, in order that they can survive and prosper. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 18. What aspect of a meme's behavior does the professor mainly discuss? Nineteen. Why does the professor say this? I should point out that some of what this is is not fully accepted by some academics. 20. What does the professor say about memes? 21. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. A meme can be an idea, a song, a, a joke, a food recipe, or even a way of constructing bridges. How to make a fire could be considered another one. Why does the professor say this? How to make a fire could be considered another one. 22. What does the professor imply about the importance of memes in our minds? 23. Listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. So, uh, we've had a look at the general distribution of Native American peoples throughout the continent and before the arrival of the Spaniards. Uh, today, I wanted to focus on a particular culture, 
which inhabited the southwest of what is today the United States. This was a remarkable group of agricultural people, uh, generally referred to as the Anasazi. And by the way, I'm going to continue to use that term, even though some people are not completely happy with it. It's the best term we've got at the moment, and all the proposed alternative names are less accurate. Okay, so these people arrived in the southwest area、uh, approximately 2,000 years ago and engaged in hunting and gathering. Over time, they developed an agricultural economy with、uh, corn, squash, and beans as their primary crops. Um, during the earlier periods, they made waterproof basketware, and today these periods are known as the basket maker cultures. We'll take a more detailed look at these cultures later on in the course.、Uh, so, anyway,、uh, eventually the Anasazi discovered that pottery was more effective for storing foodstuffs and liquids, so they developed ceramic work.、Um, Often patterned with bold, brightly colored designs, this pottery was good enough to be traded throughout the region. In fact, there's evidence that trade extended into central Mexico. Now, as well as highly skilled pottery techniques, the Anasazi also developed remarkable building techniques. They also developed a kind of road system. Well, perhaps system is the wrong word. Since the roads didn't really go anywhere, they were mostly just sections extending out from their larger houses, possibly to emphasize their status. Some authorities have said their purpose was really symbolic rather than practical. Okay,、uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, the buildings. Their dwellings and ceremonial structures were often built in inaccessible locations. On cliffs or protected by caves, a well-known example of an Anasazi building is the so-called Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde National Park. I'm sure some of you have seen pictures of this site. This large structure, oh, it contains over 200 rooms, was built on a cliff in the 1200s. It consisted of homes made of blocks of rock. Varying from simple structures to large multi-storied buildings, the Cliff Palace has generated the perception of the Anasazi as cliff dwellers. This extraordinary structure, along with other dwellings in the area, was、um, deserted around A.D. 1300, only about 100 years after it was built. Yes. Did you have a question? Why did the Anasazi build such a large city and then abandon it? Okay, I was coming to that.、Uh, the reason for the abandonment has been the source of much debate. Can anyone here think of any reason why an entire population would abandon its city? Well, the Southwest is a rather dry part of the country. Perhaps there was a drought that led to mass starvation. Okay, that is a possibility, and in fact. Tree rings from this area have been studied, and as you know, sections through trees indicate a lot about climate patterns.、Uh, these tree rings do indicate that there was a drought in the last quarter of that century.、Uh, having said that, however, it was no more severe than previous droughts, and those were not bad enough to force the people to leave. Some researchers have argued that warfare could have been a factor in the abandonment of the area. And、uh, there is evidence that by this time people were crowded into a smaller area, and some villages were moved away from lowland areas up to higher ground. This might suggest the presence of invaders, but there's not much other evidence to support this theory. Later sites appear to be built for defense, and excavation at other sites in the region indicates some violent struggles. The best we can say here. Is that warfare was a factor, but probably not the underlying factor. What about a plague? After all, there were diseases in Europe around that time that really wiped out a large part of the population. That's a possibility, but again, there's no strong evidence to support that theory. Myself, I'm coming around to the idea that there was some kind of 
environmental disaster which affected the area. We now know that the Anasazi were not living harmoniously with nature. That's a rather naive viewpoint. They exploited their environment like most human groups. Research has shown, in fact, that the Anasazi destroyed most of the larger animals through overhunting. So they were forced to hunt for smaller game animals. That would have meant less efficient use of their time. In other words, they would have found less food for the same amount of work. And another thing, they had to collect wood for cooking and for heat. And so the surrounding areas became deforested. Both of these environmental causes must have played a, a large part in their eventual disappearance from the region. Okay, so this is my thinking about this mystery. I'd have to say, though, that the general consensus today appears to be that there was a combination of factors, including environmental ones, that led to the abandonment of the communities in the region and eventually to the decline of the whole culture. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 24. What is the main topic of the lecture? Twenty-five. What does the professor imply about the term Anasazi? Twenty-six. According to the professor, why did the Anasazi start making pottery? Twenty-seven. Why does the professor say this? Ah, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, the buildings. Twenty-eight. Based on the information in the discussion, indicate whether each of the following is accepted by most scientists. 29. What does the professor imply about the Anasazi's use of their environment? 30. Listen to part of a conversation between two students. Okay, so uh, do you want to review that legal terminology that Dr. Bryant went over in class? Okay, yeah, but... Uh, I was going to meet my roommate at the Union. We plan to jog around campus for some exercise. You can come along, too, if you feel up to it. Great, thanks. I'd like that. But shouldn't we review the terms first? Okay. We've got a few minutes, I guess. So, what was the first one? Uh, it's burden of proof. What do you remember about that? Okay, well, this one has to do with the fact that in law cases, Every person is presumed to be innocent until they're proven guilty, right? Well, yeah, but what else? What's the important thing? And, and, uh, it means that the party that brings the case, that's the plaintiff, has to prove the allegations in order to win the case, okay? Okay. And the defendant, that's the person who's being accused, has the right, or the opportunity, to disprove the accusation. That is, the defendant can show or try to show that the accusation is false and that the evidence used against him or her is weak. So that means that the burden of proof is always, uh, always rests on the party, the, the person making the accusation, because the defendant is presumed innocent and so has to be proven guilty. So in a criminal case, it's up to the prosecutor to convince the judge or the jury that the allegations are true. The burden of proof rests with him or her. The prosecutor, that's the government lawyer, right? Uh, usually, but as far as I can remember, anyone can act as a prosecutor. 
uh, except, uh, except in certain types of cases. Anyway, what was the next term you wanted to review? Well, uh, what exactly is meant by circumstantial evidence? Okay, okay, circumstantial evidence. Let me think. Oh, yeah, well, that's like indirect evidence. Yeah, okay. So it kind of implies someone could have been involved in a crime. It's not, um, it's not, it doesn't in itself directly prove who did it. So what about evidence from a witness who says they heard or saw a person commit the crime? No, that's not circumstantial. That's called direct evidence. It has to be more indirect than that. Just about everything that is not direct is called circumstantial. Remember Dr. Bryant gave an example? What was it now? Yeah, okay. He gave a couple of examples. One was, um, suppose a man earns a certain known salary and then makes some big purchases way beyond what someone on his salary could afford. He, he might buy a luxury yacht or a new beachfront apartment or something. And this happens around the time he is alleged to have stolen a large sum of money. This is not direct proof, but it is circumstantial. It would help build a case against him. Right. And it could be used in a court of law, right? Yeah, right. Unless the connection is really weak. Didn't Dr. Bryant say that, in fact, most convictions in court are based on circumstantial evidence? Yeah, I remember him saying that. Most people have the opposite idea, maybe from watching too many TV dramas. But in real life, circumstantial evidence is considered very persuasive. A strong circumstantial case is often better than an eyewitness description. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 30. What are the students mainly discussing? 31. Why does the woman say this? But, uh, I was going to meet my roommate at the Union. We planned to jog around campus for some exercise. 32. According to the conversation, which of the following statements are correct? Thirty-three. What can be inferred about the value of circumstantial evidence for prosecutors? Thirty-four. According to the conversation, what do most people think about circumstantial evidence? Speaking. 1. Please listen carefully. Describe a skill you have that will be important for your success in the modern world and explain why this skill is so important. Include details and examples to support your explanation. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Two, please listen carefully. Some people work for a business and some people work in their own business. Which would you prefer to do and why? Include details and examples in your explanation. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Three, please listen carefully. The University of the Rockies Financial Aid Office has posted information about work study grants. You will have 45 seconds to read the announcement. Begin reading now. Now listen to two students as they discuss the announcement. Hey, do you know anything about the work study program? A bit. You know that guy,、uh, Jim,、uh -huh. in our philosophy class? Well, he got a grant. You have to fill in papers about your financial needs, and then you're allotted an amount of money that you can earn and told how much you get per hour. Oh, do you know how much he was paid? Uh, he was allotted the full amount. You know, Jim's from a big family, so money's tight. Uh huh. Hey, I heard there's an opening in the astronomy department. Uh, that would give me some good job experience. You applying for something? Well, it'd be nice to get some job experience and be able to work on campus, but I'm not eligible. You have to really need financial aid, and between my summer job and my parents helping me out, well. Oh, you know what? I earned some money last summer. I wonder if I'll qualify. Maybe not for the full amount. Why don't you just go fill out the financial needs assessment form and find out? No harm in trying. Now get ready to answer the question. The woman expresses her desire for a work study job. State the requirements necessary for taking part in the program and explain the advantages discussed. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Four. Please listen carefully. Read the passage about symbiotic relationships. You have forty-five seconds to read the passage. Begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture on this topic in a biology class. We have been discussing the three symbiotic relationships between species: mutualism, in which both organisms benefit; parasitism, in which one benefits and the other is harmed; and commensalism, where one benefits while neither benefiting nor harming the other. Now. Of course, these relationships are not always clear-cut.、Uh, for example, there is a plant called a bee orchid. Its flowers look like female bees,、uh, to the male bee anyway. Its flowers look like female bees,、uh, to the male bee anyway. The bee orchid tricks the male bee into mating with the flower, thus pollinating it. However, we don't know if, in fact, the relationship between this particular plant and the bee is mutualism, parasitism, or commensalism. Sometimes the relationship actually changes. Let me give you some examples. We have bacteria on our skin, for instance. These colonies of bacteria don't harm us, so we can say that at this point the relationship is commensal. But what happens if we get burned? The bacteria on our skin can take advantage of the burn and cause infections. The bacteria turn into what we call an opportunistic pathogen. A pathogen, by the way, is parasitic. And here's another example: shrimp and crabs take advantage of colonies of coral, which provide a nice home. They neither harm nor benefit the coral colonies, so the relationship. Here is also commensal, but sometimes a coral-eating sea star attacks the coral. At that point, the shrimp and crabs defend the coral. 
Without these creatures to protect it, the coral would be eaten. So, in this case, the relationship becomes mutual. The coral and its defenders are now in a relationship in which both organisms benefit. Now get ready to answer the question. The professor gives two examples of symbiotic relationships that change. Explain both examples in terms of what the original symbiotic relationship was and what symbiotic relationship it became. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. 5. Please listen carefully. Listen to a conversation between two students. Hey, Steve. I heard you've moved out of the dorms. Well, no, I haven't. I'd like to, but... Yeah, what's the problem? Well, the places close to campus are expensive, and the ones I can afford are too far to walk. So, uh, I've got to figure out what transportation's going to cost me. Buses and trains aren't that expensive, are they? Nah, the problem is schedules. Sometimes I have to stay on campus late, uh, after things stop running. So I'd have to take a taxi or get a car. What's wrong with getting a car? Gets you where you want to go at your convenience. A car? In the city? No, thanks. Besides, insurance rates are high for my age group and, you know, other costs, uh... Maintenance, parking. That's a point for being close to campus. Also, it's easy to get home if you forget something. Yeah, and sometimes I like to take an afternoon nap because of the late hours I'm in the lab. It'd be nice to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Can't if you live out in some suburb. Maybe it's best to stay in the dorms right on campus. Yeah, well, one of my complaints about the dorms is they're too noisy in the daytime. Can't sleep because everyone's got their music going. You get your meals and don't have to clean up afterwards. Um, I think I could save a lot doing my own shopping. So what's the difference in costs of um, a dorm, a place near campus, one on the train line, or, um, oh, on the bus route? I don't know. You don't know? Well, if I were you, I'd get all the figures and make a you know, hypothetical budget. A budget showing you taking a taxi three times a week and a budget for the costs of a car and just put all the possibilities on paper. I think you'd make a better decision doing that and also make a list of advantages and disadvantages. Now get ready to answer the question. The students discuss the man's options. Describe his problem. Then state which of the options you prefer and explain why. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Six, please listen carefully. Listen to part of a lecture in a cultural studies class. Although the entertainment industry is concerned with telling a good story, it has had a profound effect on people's conceptions and misconceptions of the world around them. Let me give you an example. There are many films and TV programs in which a serious crime takes place and a police detective solves or maybe doesn't solve the crime. It appears that these fictional crimes, added to news reports of real crime, cause viewers' perception of the rate of criminal behavior to outrank, to exaggerate reality. In other words, the actual, let's say, murder rate is probably well below people's perception of the murder rate. 
I've just been talking about misconceptions of crime rates, but there are other misconceptions which may be more harmful. Now, I'm not saying that believing in an exaggerated level of criminality, say a high murder rate, isn't harmful. It could cause a lot of people undue stress, for example. But what I mean is misconceptions about race and gender stereotypes. A person of a different race or a female being typecast into certain roles. Think about, for example, the portrayal of a person in a wheelchair. He or she is either portrayed as overcoming incredible odds to do heroic deeds, or, on the other hand, being a helpless victim. Does this promote understanding or misconceptions? In the movies, doctors perform miracles, lawyers win cases, and crime scene investigators find the evidence. People in these actual professions often get clients with unreasonable expectations. Professional people comment that the reality of their daily routine, their job, is seldom like that portrayed in the media. Students are sometimes disillusioned about their career choice because the job seemed much more interesting in the television program than in reality. Unfortunately, We make these judgmental mistakes about our own society, knowing full well the existence of the fantasy created by the media industry. Now get ready to answer the question. Using points and examples from the lecture, explain how the media has contributed to misconceptions about the real world. You may begin to prepare your response after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Writings. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. Often in medical research, new evidence makes us take a fresh look at causation. Now, the immediate causes of asthma are not in doubt, but there is some new thinking about the fundamental causes of this condition. It's been said that after an asthma attack, the airways of the sufferer return to normal. But what about in between attacks? Until recently, it was assumed that bronchial function returned to normal until the onset of a new attack. But it has become clear in some asthmatics that the airways can become permanently narrowed and the walls of the airways thickened. These abnormalities in asthmatics airways are due to what is called remodeling. It used to be thought that remodeling was the result of long term inflammation, a kind of scarring from repeated episodes over a long period. But more recently, it has been suggested that remodeling of the tubes is not only a result of this scarring, but also may be the primary cause of the condition. In other words, Remodeling may be fundamental to the disease. This idea has gained acceptable to the disease. This idea has gained acceptability recently due to evidence from studies of young children. This research shows that many asthmatic children already have remodeled airways. So, according to this view, remodeling is not just a consequence of asthma, it may also be an underlying cause. So, what causes the remodeling in the first place? Certainly, genetic factors play a role. But it seems that a combination of genetics and the environment are to blame. In other words, certain individuals may develop remodeled, vulnerable airways due to the environment affecting them even before birth. Summarize the points made in the lecture you just heard. Explaining how they cast doubt on the points made in the reading. The program.